Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. It's lovely to see you here. It's always uh, so encouraging to see the community gather again on an exciting night like this where we have the opportunity to engage with, a, uh, with one of our own, our own theologians, writing. Um, and it's always such a delight to hear from Daryl in whatever mode he's speaking to us. And in particular on a night like this where we see some more of the fruit of his ongoing work and his ministry over many years. And I'm glad that you've all come uh, to join in this event with us this evening. And I also do want to welcome those who are joining us by live stream. So we're grateful that we've got others joining us virtually as well. My name is Paul Spilsbury. I'm the academic dean here at Regent College and professor of New Testament. And it's my honor to, um, to host our evening together um, here tonight. Um, let me just say a word or two about the format of how things are going to go. Daryl is going to come and speak to us about his new book. I know that that's why you're all here. He's going to speak to us for about 40 minutes, so he tells me. He is a preacher, so one never knows if it's really going to be that long. But he's a pretty well organized and, um, you know, prepared kind of a guy. So I imagine it's down to the last couple of seconds. So, um, so we're going to have about 40 minutes or so from Daryl. And then there's going to be an opportunity for Q&A. So we do have two mics that have been set up. Do uh, be thinking and um, preparing your, uh, your courage to get up and ask a question um, at the conclusion of Daryl's talk. Um, and then after that, Daryl is going to be ushered away um, by a bodyguard um, not, um, to the bookstore, and he'll be there uh, signing copies of his book. So I hope that you'll take um, advantage of that opportunity as well. So let me give a little introduction to Daryl for those of you who are only getting to know him. Um, Daryl has been around here at Regent since the year 2000, I understand. Uh, before coming to Vancouver, uh, of course, Daryl had already had um, an extensive uh, ministry preaching as a, a, a pastor, senior minister in a number of different settings um, in the U.S., um, in Presbyterian churches, a number of different Presbyterian churches in the U.S., as well as um, in Union Church of Manila in the Philippines. And, um, and then he came to Regent College as a professor of pastoral theology in the year 2000. And in the years that he was with us, I understand that he was with us till about 2009 as a full-time uh, professor here at Regent College, taught a wide range of courses that many of you will have taken, I know, including Introduction to Preaching and Worship, re-evangelization of the West, education and equipping, pastoral care, and preaching of various parts of scripture. And a lot of his writing has come out of these courses, and in particular on his courses on preaching. Um, I myself have particularly benefited from his book on the book of Revelation, Discipleship on the Edge. He's also written on the Beatitudes, on experiencing the Trinity. He's written on the Lord's Prayer, and he's written a major work on preaching called The Glory of Preaching. Um, in, uh, since leaving his full-time role here at Regent, um, as many of you know, Daryl has been the pastor at um, First Baptist Church downtown and has been retired since 2016, though in Daryl's case, retirement looks like sort of stepping it up and becoming really busy. Um, so that's an example for all of us. We're privileged that Daryl uh, continues to be a teaching fellow here at Regent College and continues to have a very um, tangible and important contribution that he continues to make to the ministry of Region College. And so we're so grateful, Daryl, that you're with us tonight. I'm going to invite you to come up now to speak to us. And as Daryl comes, I'm going to pray for him. So we're going to start off um, with a word of prayer. Thanks, Paul. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for our brother Daryl, for the gifts that you have placed on this man, for the ministry and the mantle that you've given to him. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd continue to anoint him continue to uh, work through his writing and his preaching and his ministry among us. And Lord, we commit this evening to you. We pray that it would be um, all in uh, the name of our Lord Jesus, to your glory, and that uh, Daryl would know your strength. At the end of a long day, he's been already teaching since this morning, it's, and uh, we pray that you'd give him energy and grace as he speaks to us this evening. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please welcome Daryl. Thank you, Paul. It is great to be able to work with you. 
thank you all for coming out tonight in this busy week, this holy week, uh, Wednesday night. Thank you. And thank you for those of us join, joining us uh, via um, live stream. That's a whole new technology for us. Thank you. It is one grand story, the Bible. It is one grand story, the story of all stories, the story that makes sense of all other stories. I like the way Sally Lloyd-Jones puts it in her introduction to her children's Bible. Now, some people think the Bible is a book of rules telling you what you should and should not do. The Bible certainly does have some rules in it. They show you how life works best, but the Bible is not mainly about you and what you should be doing. It's about God and about what he has done, and I would add, is doing and will do. Other people think the Bible is a book of heroes, showing you people you should copy. The Bible does have some heroes in it, but as you will soon find out, most of the people in the Bible aren't heroes at all. They make some big mistakes, sometimes on purpose. They get afraid and they run away. At times, they're downright mean. No, the Bible is not a book of rules or a book of heroes. The Bible is most of all a story, an adventure story about a young hero who comes from a far country to win back his lost treasure. It's a love story about a brave prince who leaves his palace, his throne, everything to rescue the ones he loves. It is like the most wonderful fairy tales of all, but it com comes true in real life. You, you see, the best thing about this story, it is true. There are lots of stories in the Bible, but all the stories are telling one big story. The story of how God loves his children and comes to rescue them. It takes the whole Bible to tell this story. And then this. At the center of the story, there is a baby. Every story in the Bible whispers his name. He's like the missing piece of the puzzle, the piece that makes all the other pieces fit together. And suddenly, you see a beautiful picture. One grand story. The Bible. It is one grand story. The greatest story ever told. All about a living God and his relationship with the universe he called into being. All about this living God's desire to live in relationship with us humans whom he created to live in and enjoy his universe. The one grand story is written by some 40 human authors writing over a span of some 1,500 years. And amazingly, all their work comes together in one coherent whole. Now, why a book on Genesis 1 to 11? Why publish a series of expositions on the first 11 chapters of the Bible? As you know, the one grand story comes to us in two halves. Old Testament and New Testament. Both beginning with a genesis. Both beginning with a massive creative act. Old Testament, first line, in the beginning God created, genesis the heavens and the earth. New Testament, first line, this is the genesis of Jesus Christ. So, two halves, Old and New Testaments, right? But more foundationally, the two halves of the Bible are Genesis 1 to 11 and Genesis 12 through Revelation 22, which is what I try to demonstrate in this new book. Genesis 1 to 11 brings us face to face with the big issues of life, the wonder of creation, the glory of humanity, the brokenness of humanity, the entrance of evil, the advent of death, Judgment, grace, hope, the big issues. The first half of the Bible raises the big questions. Why is there something and not nothing? Did the universe just pop into being? Or is there a mind that brought it into being? Where did all this beauty around us come from? Why are we humans here? Where did we come from? What are we? What does it mean to be human? Why does it hurt to be human? Something is wrong. We all know it. We can build impressive skyscrapers and telescopes that help us look back in time to massive black holes in the heavens. We can paint magnificent pictures, write heart-moving poetry, compose music that stirs the soul, and then we take advantage of each other 
We inflict pain on each other. We speak hateful words. We even kill. What is wrong with us? Can we be fixed? How can we fix us? Is it even possible for us to fix us? Or is that why all cultures have superhero myths? Longing for someone larger than life to come and fix us. Where is God in all of this? Is he in all of this? If there is a God in all of this, what kind of God is in all of this? And then the first half of the Bible gives answers to these big questions. Answers which the authors of the second half of the Bible assume we know. That's the key thing. First 11 chapters raise questions, give answers that the rest of the Bible assumes we know especially about two trees, which we'll look at in a moment. Now, the second half of the Bible, Genesis 12 to Revelation 22, has two major parts, Old Testament and New Testament. So, too, the first half of the Bible. It, too, has two major parts, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 through 11, or more exactly, Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3. The persons who assigned the chapter number and verse numbers got it wrong there. It's, the first part is Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3. The second part, Genesis 2, 4 through chapter 11. Two very different literary genres. Genesis 1, the first part, poetry. Genesis 2 through 11, pictographic story. The first part, Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3, many call the song of creation singing the fundamental fact of life. There is a creator who out of love creates creation. There is a maker of heaven and earth. The second part then, Genesis 2, 4 through the Genesis 11, this pictographic story, as I like to call it, is the beginning of the, cre the creator's personal engagement with his human creation. After hearing in the song of creation about waters above and seas below, after hearing in the song of creation about skies above and earth below, after hearing in the song of creation about birds and sea monsters and every living thing after its kind, after hearing in the song of creation, God saying, let us make humanity in our image, followed by God's very good, we shift in Genesis 2-4 to focus on man and woman and on the beginning of the love story. At Genesis 2-4, we focus on what the Creator wills for us and why things are not working the way the Creator willed for us and what the Creator has chosen to do all about it. Now, as you read the, as you read the second part of the first half of the Bible, did that make sense? you follow me there? After you read the second part of the first half of the Bible, Genesis 2-4 through 11, you find that the story or stories follow the same pattern. The pattern is grace, rebellion, judgment, new grace. Grace, rebellion, judgment, new grace. All the stories follow the same pattern. God comes to humanity in grace, lots of grace. Human humanity rebels in some way. Then that which God warned humanity would happen, happens. There's judgment. And then unexpectedly, God gives new grace. Grace, rebellion, judgment, new grace. At the beginning of the love story, God gives the first humans grace. Adam and Eve receive grace upon grace. God gives them all they need to live full and flourishing lives. But then the first humans begin to listen to a serpent's voice twisting God's word and become suspicious of God. They conclude, with help from this serpent, that they need to take life into their own hands. They rebel. And as God warned, their world begins to fall apart. There's judgment. The garden becomes a cemetery. And then, unexpectedly and undeservedly, God offers new grace. God clothes the shame-filled naked rebels and promises that one day a seed of the woman would come who would crush the head of this serpent and restore paradise. Grace, rebellion, judgment, new grace. Following me? The pattern continues through the story of Cain and Abel. God gives Cain a brother, grace. Cain murders Abel, rebellion. Cain is banished from the garden, judgment. 
And then, unexpectedly and undeservedly, God protects Cain against those who want to murder him and enables him to build a city for his family, new grace. Then comes the story of Noah and the flood. God had given humanity, sinful humanity, all it needed to thrive. Some people living long, long lives, I mean really long, then humanity continues to sin, rebelling at progressively deeper levels. As the text says, every intent of their heart is only evil continually. It's God's words. Every intent of their heart is only evil continually. Every, only, evil continually. So judgment. God acts to cleanse his earth with a flood. And then again, unexpectedly, God spares the life of Noah and his family and begins to repeople the earth. Grace, rebellion, judgment, new grace. As the Apostle Paul would later say in the second part of the second half of the Bible, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And then comes the story of the Tower of Babel. God has graciously given humanity the capacity and skill to build a city with massive high-rise. But they build this high-rise to assert their independence from God. We will make a name for ourselves, they say. That is, we will build our own world our own way. Then, as per the pattern, God responds by giving humanity the inherent consequences of their choice. Judgment, disintegration, division, confusion, scattering. And there the story ends. Scattering. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad on the face of the whole earth, says the text. Twice. Scattered. End of story. Grace, rebellion, judgment, period, no new grace. Genesis 1 to 11 ends with humanity under judgment. Nations alienated from each other, arguing over boundary lines, wrestling for access to natural resources, and always preparing for war. Grace, rebellion, judgment. No new grace. And we're left wondering, is that it? The story cannot end there, can it, Lord? First half of the Bible, grace, rebellion, judgment, no new grace. And then, unexpectedly, the camera turns from the panoramic sweep of nations scattered in judgment and focuses on the Ur of the Chaldeans in what is now the modern-day Iraq. And we see two people named Abram and Sarai, later renamed Abraham and Sarah. And we hear the maker of heaven and earth say, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. Echoing back to the builders of the Tower of Babel. I will make your name great so that you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And those who curse you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. What gives? New grace. That is what gives. God calling Abram and Sarai out of Iraq is God's new grace to all the cities of all the nations scattered over the face of the earth. I will make your name great. I will make your name great. All that humanity is seeking to achieve in building the Tower of Babel, God will now do. God will rebuild the fallen world. God will build the city we city builders have wanted to build. The first half of the Bible ends in judgment. The second half of the Bible begins with grace. The point, the pattern of the first half of the Bible was not broken. Grace, rebellion, judgment, new grace, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. In the call on Abram and Sarai, God uses the word bless five times. Bless, 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 bless. Echoing the song sung on the first page of the first half of the Bible, and God blessed them. Of God's call on Abraham and Sarah, David Atkinson says, here is another new beginning. The beginning of the second half of the Bible is another new beginning. The second half of the grand story leading to the birth of the son of the woman, to Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, who himself is a new creation 
who brings about a new heaven and a new earth. But we are getting ahead of ourselves. Back to Genesis 1 to 11. At the heart of the first half of the grand story is what I call the tale of two trees. The whole story turns on these two trees. Genesis chapter 2, verses 7 to 9 and 16 to 17. Genesis 2, 7 to 9 and 16 to 17. Listen. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden. And there he placed the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life, which is in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you shall surely die. The tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat from it, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Up to this point, the author of Genesis is celebrating the extravagant grace of God. From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. The creator has given his creature all that is needed in order to live in God's good creation. The creator wants his children to enjoy the overflowing abundance of his good creation. From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. Any, freely. It's all for you. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. It is the only command in the first part of the story. From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat from it you will surely die. The only command given in the garden, do not eat from this tree. I submit to you that it is, in the final analysis, the only command God has ever given us. All other commands are but another way of speaking this one command. Do not eat from this tree. Now, before seeking to understand this command, I want to ask, why no command relative to the tree of life? At the beginning of the tale of two trees, the author does not say anything about the tree of life, except that it is in the middle of the garden. Later in the story, at the end of Genesis 3, the tree of life will come into the picture. And the way to the tree of life in the middle of the garden is blocked. I try to show in my book that that is sheer grace. But why no word about the tree of life at the beginning of this tale of the two trees? Well, I think Dietrich Bonhoeffer gives the best answer. In his book, Creation and Fall and Temptation, he wrote, The tree of life was in the middle. That's all that's said about it. The life that comes from God is in the middle. This means God who is life is in the middle. In the middle of the world which is at Adam's disposal and over which he has been given dominion is not Adam himself, but the tree of divine life. Adam's life comes from the middle, which is not Adam himself, but God. It constantly revolves around this middle without ever making the attempt to make this middle of existence its own possession. It is characteristic of man, by man he means man and woman, it is characteristic of man that his life is a constant circling around its middle but that it never takes possession of it. And this life from the middle, which only God possesses, is undisturbed as long as man does not allow himself to be flung out of his groove. Adam is not tempted to touch the tree of life, to lay violent hands on the divine tree in the middle. There's no need at all to forbid this. He would not understand the prohibition, for he has life. But what Adam does not have is the knowledge of good and evil. And as we shall see, he does not need it. Thus, the one command in the garden, from any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Only one command, only one, only one. How many? One. Now, to rightly understand this command, I think it's helpful to make a number of clarifications or a number of qualifications. 
First clarification, prohibiting us from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and one must always say the whole mouthful, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, prohibiting us from eating from this tree is no way unfair or unreasonable. God has given humanity all we need to live fully human, fully alive. Any tree, eat freely. In the beginning, we had everything we need, which is to say that in his do not eat, God is not prohibiting something we need. We don't need this. We do not need to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God is not being unfair or unreasonable. Another clarification. As the creator, the Lord God has the right to make the rules, <laughs> even if they were unfair or unreasonable. The creator of the game has a right to determine how the game is played. One of the most scary things I have ever heard anyone say is, no one is going to tell me how to live my life. And that is really scary when no one includes the creator. The creator has the right to tell me how to live my life. The creator has the right to make the rules, and there is at root only one. Another clarification. God gives this prohibition for our good. God warns us, you will die. Eat from this tree and you will die. Note well, God does not say, I will punish you. God does not say, I will make you die. God does not say, I will kill you. God says, if you eat from this tree, I will not need to punish you. The natural consequences of eating from this tree is death. Sooner or later, you will die. Now, all of God's commands, Ten Commandments, Sermon on the Mount, are given not to ruin our lives, but to prevent us from ruining our lives. And God prohibits us from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for our good. Another clarification. Giving this prohibition reveals God's respect for us human beings. God is treating us as free, rational creatures. God giving such a command to a robot would be nonsensical. As Bible teacher Larry Richard put it, there's no moral dimension to the existence of a robot. It can only respond to the program of its maker. To be truly like God, humans must have freedom to make moral choices. God is respecting us in giving us this command. Another clarification. In giving the one command, God is taking a big risk. God created a beautiful world, Genesis 1. Very good, tov meod, paradise in every sense of the word. And then places in this good world a creature who has the capacity to choose, who just might make the wrong choice. The great German preacher Helmut Thielicke expresses this risk so powerfully. In a sermon he preached at the end of World War II in the bombed out sanctuary in Stuttgart, he wrote, and I give you the full text in the book I wrote, but I'll give you just the, the kernel of it. Thielicke writes, when God comes to create human beings, one can almost detect something like a hesitation or even a recoil. In any case, it is the kind of bated breath with which we ourselves are familiar when we approach a decisive point in some piece of work on the success of which everything depends. We stop and stand off for a while. It may be the experience of a roofer who has covered a church steeple with shingles and then in one final risky effort set the clock upon the peak. Or as a dramatist who sets out to compose the main and key scene in the play. So when God pauses before he composes man and woman into his creation, we sense that there is a risk connected with it. Will the creation of the human mean the coronation of creation or its crucifixion? Will creation reach its pinnacle when there is added to its creatures a being who rises above the dull level of reflex and instinct, who is endowed with mind and will and is capable of living as a partner and co-worker of God as creator? Or is the creation of this being called man the first stage in a tremendous descent that starts in the Garden of Eden and leads to a disturbed and desolated earth that transforms the child and image of God into a robber and a rebel and through him carries war and rumors of war to the farthest plants. Coronation or crucifixion? That is the question here. In giving this prohibition, God is taking a big risk. 
another clarification. In God's command, we are not confronted with a choice between good and evil. Let me say that again. In God's command, we are not confronted with a choice between good and evil. It is one tree, the knowledge of good and evil, not a tree of good and a tree of evil. God does not create something evil and then place it alongside something good and call us to make a choice. If God had created an evil tree, wrote Francis Schaeffer, then we would have here the concept like the Hindu idea that eventually both good and evil, cruelty and non-cruelty, spring from God and are thus finally equal. One tree, the knowledge of good and evil, not an evil tree and a good tree. One final clarification. The, prohibition, the prohibited tree is not called the tree of knowledge. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Not the tree of knowledge. And I think a lot of confusion has been caused by careless refer, referring to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as the tree of knowledge. Even as brilliant a thinker as Eric Fromm read it incorrectly and held the view that Genesis is teaching that God does not want humanity to know or think or use our brains. Goodness gracious. God is not afraid of human beings gaining knowledge. Would you agree? I mean, what are we going to discover that God does not already know? What are we going to discover that's going to surprise God or threaten God? Can you imagine God last week saying, whoa, black hole, weighing 100 million times the weight of the sun? Wow, where did that come from? No. What are humans going to learn that's going to throw God off balance? God delights in our discovering truth and learning all we can about the created order. Agree? God finds great joy in our finding out how the universe works, how our bodies and minds and hearts work. I think God wants us to know as much as we can about his handiwork. I think God finds great delight in the medical discoveries made over here at UBC. It's a false spirituality that asks us to stop thinking in order to believe. Just stop thinking so much and just believe is not biblical spirituality. Stop fretting and believe, yes. <laughs> but not stop thinking. So the prohibited tree is not the tree of knowledge. It is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You shall not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so what is God saying in speaking this one command? The phrase, the knowledge of good and evil, refers to a particular kind of knowledge. Say that again. The knowledge of good and evil refers to a particular kind of knowledge. Trace how this idiom is used in the rest of the Bible and we understand why God prohibits it. For it turns out that only God has it, the knowledge of good and evil, and it turns out that only God can have it and still live. The idiom is used in particular with reference to children, and the elderly. Children are said to not have it. Children do not have the knowledge of good and evil. Deuteronomy 139, you little ones until this day have no knowledge of good and evil. Oh, children have a lot of knowledge, do they not? Sharon's and my grandchildren know a lot. I get frustrated using my iPhone and they'll take it out of my hand and say, here grandpa, just use this app. They, and they know good and they know evil. But what they do not have is the knowledge of good and evil, Isaiah 7, 15. And elderly people, according to the Bible, have lost it. 2 Samuel 19, 35. I'm now 80 years old. Can I know good and evil? Mercy, 80-year-olds know a lot. And it's a lot of knowledge that needs to be shared. 80 years old, no, 90 year olds know a lot. No good, no evil. But what 80 and 90 year olds are beginning to lose is the knowledge of good and evil. So, what is this idiom all about? You'll have to read the book. Thank you for coming. <laughs> what is this idiom all about? Children do not have it, the elderly have lost it, and those in between think they have it. Daniel Fuller, the first biblical theologian 
under whom I had the privilege of studying 50 years ago now, 50 years, whoa, has in my mind done the most complete work on this phrase. After working through every use of the idiom in the Bible, Dr. Fuller concludes, it would appear that to the original readers of Genesis 2, the expression, to know good and evil, signify the possession of that maturity which frees one from being dependent on someone else for guidance in how to act wisely. Let me read that again. It would appear that to the original readers of Genesis 2, the expression to know good and evil signify the possession of that maturity which frees one from being dependent on someone else for guidance on how to act wisely. This is what little children do not have and what we start to lose as we age. To know good and evil signifies the capacity to live independently without the help of anyone else to help us make our way through life. So Dr. Fuller concludes, the command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would thus mean that Adam and Eve were not to aspire to that maturity possessed by God himself, whereby they might consider themselves to be free from dependence on God and able to achieve the harmony they now enjoyed by taking matters entirely into their own hands. Only God has that kind of knowledge. Only God can live independently of another. This is how I then paraphrase the only command God gave in the garden. Adam, you are what you are because of me your creator. You are a glorious creature, magnificent beyond what you yourself know. I've made you to be dependent on me for life. And all I ask is that you be you, a creature, a human being. You are free, but do not use your freedom to try to be other than you are. Do not try to be, try to be your own God. For all your magnificence, you cannot be your own God. You be you, and I will be I. Do not try to be what I am. I tell you this for your own sake. Because if you try to be me, if you try to be an independent being, you will ruin your world. You will die. Now, do you hear the love in that command? God wants us to truly live. So, God warns us that when we sign a declaration of independence, we're signing our death certificate. Only one command. Do not try to live apart from me. Do not try to live without me. It is the one command God is speaking to every human being every moment of every day. Do not aspire for that kind of knowledge that makes you think you can live without me. It does not work. It cannot work. You must live dependent on me. Genesis 3. Aided by the deceptive talk of the serpent, Adam and Eve choose not to take God at his word. Adam and Eve conclude that they will make it on their own. Genesis 3, 6, they took and ate. They took and ate. That is, they cast off dependence on God and took upon themselves the responsibility of making life work on their own. And they quickly discovered that they were not able to make it work. They discovered that when they ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they did not then obtain the knowledge of good and evil. They were not now independent. They were now dependent on things beneath their dignity. They discovered that after all, they are not God. See what the text is telling us as that we were not created to be self-sufficient, self-directing, self-sustaining beings. Human autonomy is a myth. It's a great myth leading to death in every sense of the word. They took and they ate. And as James Dunn puts it, instead of becoming more like God, they became less like the humans God had made them to be. 
but consistent with the pattern, the Creator did not give up. God went after Adam and Eve. God went after all Adams and Eve. God comes after us. God comes all the way down into the garden that had become a cemetery to bring us back to the original intent of creation. Jesus, the second Adam, the son of Abraham, the seed of the woman, calls out to us. Truly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Why become like children? Because children are incompetent to make life work on their own. And then Jesus says to us, I am the true vine. I'm the true tree. Referring to the tree of life. I am the true vine. You are the branches. Abide in me and I in you. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Only one command. Only one. All the other commands are variations on the theme. Trust me, God is saying. I will be God. You be human. I'll be the creator. You be the creature. Live in intimate dependence on me. Eve took and ate. Adam took and ate. Adam's and Eve's children took and ate. And all of their children and all of their children's children took and ate. I took an eight, you took an eight, and we all began to die. We do not hear the words, take and eat again, in the rest of Genesis 1 to 11, nor in Genesis 12 to Revelation 22. They do not appear together again until that night when the maker of heaven and earth gathered his first disciples who were becoming like children, around a table in an upper room. Jesus lifts a loaf of bread, gives thanks, breaks it, gives it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. Take, eat. I am the bread of life. Whoever eats this bread, this fruit, will not die. Will not die. Will not die. Whoever eats this bread lives forever. Talk about new grace. <laughs> What a story, making sense of all other stories, putting everything else into perspective. Thanks be to God. looking at my boss there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Daryl. Wow, that's exciting. Makes us all want to get that book, which is on sale for how much? <laughs> What's the price on this? Hmm? Okay. 20 bucks-ish. Okay, friends, we've got some microphones. We're ready to go for interaction with Daryl. Um, as you're making your way to the microphone, um, Daryl, talk to us about the importance of story. Why, why is that so powerful, do you think, in the Bible? Why not just sort of explain this in sort of propositional form? Why is it that Scripture uses story and kind of embeds this in, you know, in, in a story like this that's, you know, you have to interpret, you have to kind of work with it, you yeah. have to think deeply about it. What is it about story specifically that seems to be so important in the way Scripture speaks to us? Well, I mean, we, we make sense of our world through story. Um, story goes beyond our rational thinking, goes beyond our emotion, into our imagination. And we live in our imaginations. And story is a way to get into that imagination and shape it in, in, a, in the way that God wants it to go. Um, I, I've only recently come onto the power of story. I was, my undergraduate degrees in physics and theoretical mathematics, so I know how to do the propositional stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm having to learn about the power yeah. of story. Um, also, I think story makes you have to think because the story doesn't tie it all up nice and neat. Mm -hmm. You wonder what that's about, so you have to in be engaged at all the, your levels, your heart, your mind, and mm -hmm. soul, um, and the story just draws you in at a deeper level than mere proposition. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have to resist the temptation to re yeah. reduce story to propositions. Right. Yeah. yeah, let the story be a story. <clears throat> Please, sir. 
Yep. According to Rashi, there was a previous commandment in Eden. God in Revelation in Genesis 1.11 commands the earth to produce fruit trees. Instead of that, it produces trees that bear fruit. Now, according to Rashi, that was kind of a rebelling against God. Also, each time God creates, he says it's good. At the end of the sixth day, he says all creation was very good. Then it seems the Lord God comes and uh, publicly declares that things aren't all that good. And then he, uh, from that, he creates a woman. But he, he declares that what God created needed improvement. So. I'm not sure. The sound in here was a little off for me. I didn't get the whole question. Uh, can you restate it? Could you just simplify? Like, what is the, what is the one question that you want to ask? It, it, and it's, the sound is bouncing around. And, yeah. Okay. Rossi says that there is a previous commandment. Then in Genesis oh. 111, God commands the earth to produce be fruitful uh, and mul- trees. He reduces trees when not fruit. Good. So, so, so Genesis 1, 28, be fruitful and multiply. Those other commands there. No, one, uh, Genesis 1, 11. 1, 11. Oh, let the earth, sp- oh, God is speaking to creation is speaking those commands. Ah, very good. The, the, in the, very good. In the song of creation in Genesis 1, you've got a series of God's uh, performative commands, right? Uh, where he's calling into being out of nothing. Uh, very good. So I, I, should, I think I qualified it. There's only in the garden, there's only one command. That's what I was trying to emphasize. Oh, yeah. The whole, the whole book begins with a whole series of God being able to be, 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 be. And God's word performs and makes it happen. Yeah. Very good. Hi. Um, Daryl, I read your book on Revelation. That's the end of the story. And now you've written a book on Genesis, the beginning of the story. Yes? Yes. And it, did you, when you were doing your Genesis study, um, think of your study on Revelation and make any correlations in terms of the two, beginning and very ending? I heard one reference already. Yeah. Um, and I have a couple other follow-up questions. Well, very good question. If, if, in fact, I'm right about looking at Genesis 1 to 11 as first half, Genesis 12, Revelation as second half, the first half ends with a city, the people attending to build a city, it doesn't work. It collapses. But the second half, Revelation 21 and 22, ends with a city that does, in fact, work, a city built by God. So that's a neat connection. You've got the tree of life in Genesis 3 that is blocked, by the way, and I when you read the book, you'll see, I think that's grace, because if you're living in rebellion, living independently of God, uh, to touch that life and now live forever independently, that would be horrible. So God blocks that. But you got the tree of life there, and now in Revelation 22, you got the tree of life on both sides of the river. Um, so those connections there, yeah. Some, some master author steps back and puts all this thing together. Is that what you're getting at? Partly, yes. Um, one other thought is, um, let's say Moses has got his hand and sure. fingerprints all over Genesis, and John has his fingerprints all over Revelation, and you have two separate audiences that are being uh, original audiences. Um, is there something in your studies about how the original audiences read Genesis and how the original audiences of John's time read Revelation and any correlation between the two? Paul's written on Revelation too. Um, no, no, not along, not not in my reading thus far, along those lines. What I can say is that John, I think John is the writer of Revelation. I think he's also the writer of the Gospels. Sure. Um, in both cases, both of those documents are saturated with Scripture. I don't know how many references to the Old Testament in the Book of Revelation. 365, some people say 525, but a lot. And same thing in the Gospel of John. Uh, everything that, that Jesus is saying is John is echoing some Old Testament text. So John would say, um, if you go back and read everything else that's written in Scripture before I wrote it, this will make sense because I'm drawing on that. Whether consciously or unconsciously, he's steeped in it, he's soaked in it, so he's going to write out of that context. 
Okay. Just one last thing, since I don't see anybody standing. Quick. I don't know. I, I don't know of any place in the second half of the Bible that says to people directly read read Genesis one to eleven. No. But it's a, it's assumed we read that fundamental story. So you've got possibly Moses' audience as the people of God in the wilderness, ex-slaves. And then you have John's audience as people in the empire that are under huge pressure. Yeah. So I was just wondering if you had any. Very good. Okay. Similar context. Yeah, both needing an, uh, an exodus being, to be set free. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Hey, Daryl. Thanks for this. Um, you're, as you were talking, I thought of the quote by Alistair McIntyre of, we can't answer the question, who am I, without first answering the question, to which story do I belong? Good. And it just struck me, though, that our culture today is the exact opposite, where I actually can figure out who I am without touching a, narr without touching a grand narrative. I am actually who I am without that. And so it, it just feels like it's flipped, like I can go to a personality test to answer who I am. I can, you know, I think therefore I am. It's very much about the autonomous self. And so how do we even begin to start addressing or urging the importance of understanding the biblical narrative in a world that doesn't prize narrative at all? And maybe that's why the gospel is blossoming in places like the global south, where they do prize story above us. Um, so yeah, that's, I'm not sure how to do that. Oh, huge question. Sorry. Very good question. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you as a preacher would be asking that question. Uh, very good, very good. I, 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 very good. That's our, that's our job. I would say two comments in terms of what you said there. Are we not witnessing in our time the mass confusion? Um, my millennial friends tell me we are a confused, confused generation because we don't have any meta narrative to make sense. This, this project of trying to say, this is who I am uh, because I think of him, isn't working. It isn't working. So that's one appeal. The other thing I would say is we just simply need to be inviting people into this story. Keep telling it. Um, and, and just saying, almost saying, we have an alternative story. Uh, like this coming Sunday. Uh, this great story of, of the resurrection. I just said in the preaching class earlier today, you don't need to go looking for illustrations. There are no illustrations for this. This is such a brand new thing that's happened. Just tell the story. There is a good story. Um, and, um, and, 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 and I think people are, are open to that. Um, I, I read the present context as, as, as people are beginning, to, are beginning to feel we are collapsing. It's falling apart big time. And we need something to make sense. And I think if we can find a winsome, gracious, loving way to do this, we'll get a hearing now. That's my response. So I'll keep going. Keep saying this. Hi, Daryl. Thank you. Um, I have a question that is kind of um, much more down to earth. Um, <laughs> there is, you know, the understanding of uh, what is gospel, right? It's a big word that it's encompasses the, the meta narrative, the whole story. So I wonder, after, after um, studying particularly in Genesis 1 to 11 and connecting to the whole Bible, how would, you, <clears throat> how would you share the heart of God in terms of gospel? Like if the core message of the gospel, how would you share with people? Because I, I think where I'm coming from is I uh, kind of pondering about how other people share the gospel nowadays. Um, with all this, like, you know, fast messages and, and things, and even doesn't um, encompasses a whole meta narrative. So um, I wonder how you would put forth um, the core message of the gospel. Okay. <clears throat> I, I heard two questions. Um, how would I put the core message of the gospel if I only had Genesis 1 to 11? Not that. No, it's just okay. in light of that. In yeah. light of in that. In light of your, your, your discovery, particularly on this book and this um, yeah, study of yours. Well, when you read the book, I don't mean that as a way to sell the book. Um, what I try to show in every single chapter is that there's gospel in all of this all the way around. The garden becomes a cemetery. 
Adam and Eve fall apart relationally. They don't know who they are. That's why they have to cover themselves. They're ashamed. All those, those things are going on. Then in Genesis 3, God acts in all kinds of merciful ways. He dresses them. He enables Eve to still give birth to a child. He gives strength to Adam to still work the ground. Um, just grace upon grace that's there. Um, I think as Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, that God's grace keeps, keeps pace with the avalanche of sin in, in Genesis 3 to 5. So if that's where the gospel of grace is there constantly, constantly, constantly. So that's one thing, how we would use Genesis 1 to 11 to that. But you're asking a bigger question. How do we communicate the gospel to our time? That, it's, it's a challenge because, and I'll use my hands, the gospel is huge. Yes. Uh, how to put it in one word? Well, the one word is Jesus. But how, how do you explain that? There, this part of the gospel, this part of the gospel, this part of the gospel, this part of the gospel. So I say to us preachers and to would-be preachers, you preach that part of the gospel that Sunday, the next part of the gospel the next Sunday, just keep going. And over a period of time, people began to realize this is bigger than I thought and better than I ever imagined. Am I speaking yeah, yeah, to yeah. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Daryl, it seems to me that we live in a culture where stories are, um, in, in some ways, you know, we're obsessed with stories. You know, think about, um, say, the phenomenon of Netflix and other kinds of streaming services like this. People spend, you know, hours upon hours on uh, binge watching. Um, you know, any number of stories constantly. And you got some of these uh, storytellers are creating whole universes. You've yeah. got the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and you've got Harry Potter, and you've got Star Wars that keeps on proliferating spin offs and spin offs and so on. So there are attempts to create massive stories. So yeah. there's a kind of longing, isn't there, that's yes, there in is. our culture for this grand story. And perhaps what you're touching on here is that here you've already got this ancient biblical story that already has done this work for us. We need to kind of rediscover it. And that's why I use the phrase, make sense of all other stories. Mm -hmm. um, my presupposition would be that um, cultures throughout time have made up these stories as a way to make sense of their lives. And the evangelistic connection mm -hmm. is to find out how these stories point to mm -hmm. the true story, uh, my presupposition. Um, how, how those stories point to that story and how this story fulfills those stories. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned Marvel. So two days ago, I go to London Drugs because Time Magazine has this special edition on Marvel. Mm -hmm. So I bought it because my grandkids are you know, into all the superheroes and, and um, I, I've got to understand the world that's being shaped in their mind. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's all fun, to, in my mind, simple statement, they all fundamentally have the same thing it is. Something's wrong. We've tried to fix it. We can't fix it. There must be somebody outside of us who comes to fix it. Bingo. So I'd want to say to Marvel folks, bless you. You got it. <laughs> now, my grandson gave me this t-shirt. and I have a, on my phone, I have a picture. I don't know how to look at it. A picture of all these, um, help me share, all these Superheroes mm -hmm. are gathered around. Maybe you've seen this. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is sitting in the middle of it. And, then, and the little caption is, and that's how I saved the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so the evangelistic task is to listen to the stories. Other people are spinning. They're not dumb. They're doing their best. Mm -hmm. And how can we tie into it and say, hey, I've got another story. Give this a shot. Great, shall we call it a, a night right there? And we'll, we'll um, move to the next phase. So Daryl is gonna be available now in the bookstore for signing all of your copies. <laughs> so, um, but let's uh, thank Daryl for this wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks for coming.